Whoever thought making a baby could be so hard? Luckily, the fertility journey isn't meant to be traveled alone. Eloise Drain has helped hundreds of people build and grow their families over the last 15 years, and she's ready to share her insider knowledge and expertise with you. So grab a seat and let's talk fertility and alternative family building in the Fertility Cafe. Welcome to Fertility Cafe. I'm your host, Eloise Drain. We're going to speak with Shaquita Lockley. She is a storyteller, a playwright, and the founder of Lady Lock Productions, a company focused on telling stories from a marginalized perspective. She has acted as creative director and live event producer for churches and gospel artists, written a children's book, and she's here with us today to talk about her recent project, Eggs Over Easy, Black Women and Fertility. This is a documentary film about Black women fertility, family building choices, and maternity care. Shaquita is the executive producer and director of Eggs Over Easy. Welcome, Shaquita. It is great to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, Eloise. It's been too long, but know, I'm glad to be here now. <laughs> it has. It has. Okay, so I know I just shared a bit about your bio, but would you mind sharing a bit about yourself? Um, absolutely. So I'm a filmmaker and I say a, a director by default, because as you know, on my newest project, a documentary, Eggs Over Easy, I ended up being the director because I didn't have a budget um, to hire a director, like to pay anybody. So I say I'm a director by default. But prior to that and what I do with the rest of my life, um, I, I, I produce live events, um, a live event producer. So sometimes it's just a live event. Many times it's a live event for television or for film. So that's kind of my work background. I went to Spelman for undergrad. I went to Emory. I um, got my master's in film studies. And I've been working primarily in the faith-based space ever since. Okay, so I understand that your intention with this film was to help remove the stigma and shame attached to the topic of reproduction, infertility, and family building for Black women. Mm -hmm. um, what was your initial inspiration? Like, what was the catalyst for this documentary? So I was turning maybe 41. I think I was turning 40, around the time I was turning 41. Every year around my birthday, I have my, my physical. I have my, um, my pap smear, mammogram, all that good stuff. So on this particular day, my gynecologist at the time, she looks at my chart and she says, oh, Miss Lockley, you have a birthday coming up. Your eggs are turning 40 or whatever age I was, like 41 maybe. Um, but your eggs are turning 40 years old is mm -hmm. essentially what she said. And then she asked um, if I had any plans for these eggs. Did I know what I wanted to do with them? And I don't know what happened after that because it caught me so off guard. Number one, nobody had ever asked me that. Number two, she was very kind about it. You know, she wasn't trying to like sound an alarm. But at the same time, she was trying to sound an alarm, like to get my attention. And I always say I knew like what my next jobs were going to be. I knew what my vacations were going to be. But I had no idea about a fertility plan. What is that? Nobody ever talked to me about a fertility plan. And I went to a women's college. I have a lot of friends and most of them are women, like 98% are women. We hadn't talked about it. My family, uh, my, I have all these aunts. Most of my cousins are girls. I have sisters. We hadn't talked about it. I'm in a sorority. <laughs> we hadn't talked about it. So where was this question coming from? And why, if I, someone who is in the space with so many Black and brown women, if I'm not having that conversation, most women probably are not having that conversation because I'm surrounded by women. Mm -hmm. And we go to brunch every Sunday prior to, you know, mm -hmm. the pandemic. Um, we brunched a lot. We hung out a lot. But we're not talking about this very important thing. Fertility preservation, or what, what do you want to what do you want to do with it? So I said I would do a ten minute short documentary. I would just highlight, just to bring some attention to it. My friends could watch it, my family could watch it, and I would call it a day. But when I started researching, everybody early on, everybody was just someone I knew in my like in my relatives, my friends, my family. So I would talk to somebody at, at say a brunch. Um one of my friends said, Oh, I just miscarried my husband and I. Um we were using international donor eggs. 
Well, what is the international donor egg? And who paid for this? How does one pay for this? How much does it even cost? Where did you, did you have to like fly somewhere? What does this mean? So I started having all these questions and every person I talked to would say, oh, you remember my friend we met at XYZ? Or you remember my cousin? Or you remember my coworker? So these were people I knew. Mm -hmm. So once I started doing pre-interviews before I shot anything, because you were actually my first interview that I shot, Mm -hmm. but all of my pre-interviews, I knew these people because they were my friends. And and the topics ranged from anywhere from fibroids to hysterectomies to miscarriage to myomectomies to adoption to egg freezing. All these things were happening amongst my friends. But because we never brought it up, we didn't really talk about it. Like I knew of a couple of the miscarriages. I knew of one friend's fibroid surgery because I had taken her to the um, to the hospital that morning. She needed somebody to drive her and sign her in. And so I did that. That was why I knew. Because other than that, we would just say, oh, I'm having a feminine procedure. Mm-hmm. Well, what is a feminine procedure? It might be a surgery that cuts your body in half. Like it that opens you wide. That is not a minor procedure. That is a full-on surgery, but it's not something that, even with the language you use, if we talk about it, like if your mom says, oh, I'm having a a feminine procedure, which is what my mom said when I was about 14 or 15. It wasn't. It was a full hysterectomy. That is not just a small feminine procedure, you know? So when I collected the footage, we ended up with well over five hours, and that was early on, before I even hit the halfway mark. And it, I knew then that this was not going to be a 10 minute small situation that I could pay for out of my pocket. Um, and that led to a Kickstarter campaign, which we were successful in. And that Kickstarter is what paid for the first set of interviews, which were maybe the first 10 interviews, probably like 100 hours of footage total with the B-roll and backstory. But that's what the Kickstarter paid for. And from there, because I was paying out of pocket, all my friends were giving me money to help do this project. We pieced it together um, little by little until we now have a finished film. Mm, I'm so excited. Thank you. I'm excited to see it. And you know you're one of the stars. Uh, the- yes, yes. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a stupid star. <laughs> no, you were amazing. Amazing. I mean, oh gosh. So, and I think that is where, number one, just as women as a whole, we do a disservice to ourselves, regardless of color, right? I think we do this disservice to ourselves because we assume that the next person doesn't want to hear about our personal problems. Number mm-hmm. One. Mm-hmm. We also, it's not necessarily that that other person doesn't want to hear. You also don't want to share that information with people. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's personal, number one. Number two, you don't want to hear the judgment. Yeah. Well, you know, okay, well, I mean, yeah, you're having problems, but girl, you know what? Just leave that in God's hands. He's mm-hmm. the of it. He, you know, if this, if it, that's his will for you, it will happen. And mm-hmm. it very well may. But what about all of the other steps in the process and the roads that you have to go through in between that? And I mm-hmm. think that's where we all do a disservice because we you know, you start here and you have to go, you have to go through the promised land in order to get the promise that God gave you. Mm -hmm. Well, if you recall in the Bible, them going through the promised land for 40 years and circling around and around and around until Mm -hmm. they finally got to the promised land and they finally got to where God promised them, it was no walk in the park. No, it was not. And they still had somebody there to help them along the way. And we all collectively need to have somebody to help us Mm -hmm. along the way. Yes. You know, like you were saying, you took your friend to the hospital to drop her off. And good thing that you were there for her. Mm -hmm. But could you have been more of a support had she even said it beforehand and talked about it? And, all you know, all of the things that we don't really do as, Mm -hmm. as women. Yeah, and I think you also have to note that there is shame oftentimes also attached to it. So one of the reasons that women aren't talking about it is because there is some shame attached to it many times because you think as a woman, my body is supposed to be able to do X, Y, and Z because since the beginning of time, women are supposed to be able to carry babies successfully. So when you're in a situation where that is not happening, women sometimes carry that burden of shame because they think that they can't do something that 
everybody is supposed to be able to do. So I think that also keeps us from talking about it. And it, you know, that's just not a good look for us as a community because you kind of put yourself on the island by yourself. So you're not talking about it and nobody yep. can help you because they don't even know you're going through right. this situation. Right. Exactly. But then again, and then also going back to your point of you were 41 before anybody ever spoke to you about a fertility plan. Yeah. yeah. Why are the doctors and the people that we're going to and the professionals that we're going to and not having these conversations Mm -hmm. early on? Why are we waiting Mm -hmm. until somebody gets into their late 30s or their early 40s and then have Mm -hmm. start having those conversations, especially in the black and brown community, which leads me actually to um, my next question for you about why black women um or or and i i feel that they well we know that they're treated differently in medicine and with that implicit bias um mm-hmm. and which we know is the pre-reflective attribution of particular qualities by an individual to a member of some social out group uh, which suggests that people can act on the basis of prejudice and stereotypes without intending to do so yeah. So that pretty much is the definition of implicit bias. Um, and I actually just had a situation not too long ago with it that I don't think that there was any in, ill intention on the mm-hmm. professional's part, but I had to check this professional because of comments that were made that, again, I really truly feel was there was no ill intention there, mm-hmm. but it was completely oblivious. That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. So I, it's very interesting. A couple of things, and I don't want to <laughs> prolong the time, but I'll just mention two things that kind of, I guess it just highlights exactly what you're saying, but it kind of also ticks me off. So I was on a podcast a few months ago. I did a pre-recorded, I pre-recorded my part, and then they sent me the, the playback, and it was lovely. They put it together well. It was, you know, awesome. And they had a physician who was uh, one of the spokespeople for the their company give his response. And his response was, as a white male, I did not know any of this information. The reason it's a problem for me is because I'm a white male physician, and I didn't know this information. And now I need to go revisit how or if I've done any of these things to my Black women patients. Did I not treat them when they said they were in pain? Did I ignore a sign? Because I didn't even realize any of this was here, and I've been a doctor for 20 plus years. So when I heard that, I had to pause because my knee-jerk reaction is like, where have you been? Why, why, where have you been? Because you are a physician treating Black and brown women, and for 20 years it never <laughs> occurred to you? That you may have implicit bias. Now, I, I don't believe the man was a racist. I don't know him from a hole in the wall. So he I, I can't say it, speak to that. But just from his response, I would take it that he probably is not a racist. And this is implicit bias because he never even thought about it. And so when he was giving his remarks, he said, I'm going to watch this again because I don't know why I never knew this. I'm not a doctor. I'm, I, I have a master's in film studies. Like I research out past Google, like you start with Google, but then you need to get you some medical journals. So I did the research, but I am not a doctor. So the fact that I could find this stuff relatively easily, I mean, it takes a minute to read through all the the journals, but this is not buried away somewhere. You can Google the CDC and find any statistic you want to find. So why does he not know that? So that's the first part. And then the second part that kind of highlights what you're saying that I needed to take a moment to pause for. On June the 2nd, when the Black Lives Matter, everybody put up this yes. black square. If you on your Instagram, if you were in entertainment, we wanted to, you know, highlight that there's there's not equity. There's not enough equity. So what happened is my inbox started flooding from well-intentioned white people who wanted to share their platform, share their Instagram, amplify, and, you know, all this stuff, which is good and great. And some of them months out, you know, they're still checking in, they're still amplifying, and they're still trying to do their part. What was most surprising to me is that it took all these, like, we've been dying in the streets. Black people have been getting killed. So it took all of this, particularly George Floyd, for these well-intentioned people to pause and say, oh my goodness, 
Mm-hmm. Let me check myself. Mm-hmm. Let me see what my role has been in this, if any. And if I haven't, you know, done anything intentionally to adversely affect Black folks, let me at least now make sure that I am intentional about positively affecting Black folks. And these were doctors. <laughs> these are not laymen on the street. Mm-hmm. These are white women mostly who are doctors. Mm-hmm. And this is on June the 2nd of 2020. Mm -hmm. This is when it hit home for them. If my patient is saying she has a headache and she just had a baby, I may want to send her home with a blood pressure cuff. I may want to have her come back in so that I could test her to make sure she's not stroking out. What I'm not going to do is just automatically say take a Tylenol. Yeah. Because she might die. So it took all of that. Did all of that have to happen? Yeah. Before then the majority of our physicians do not look like us. They're not black and brown people. So for the majority of our healthcare givers, it took all of that to bring them to a pause just to say, okay, I should pay attention to this. Mm -hmm. That is mind blowing to me. I'm glad we're here. You know, thank God we're here. Yes. Yes. But look at what it took to get here. And then how, how are they going to maintain it? Because I don't feel like it's our responsibility to maintain it and do the work for them. (laughs) I think they have to do their own work. Many of them are, but not all of them are. And we can't manage it or police it because the work, that kind of work, that's on them to do. So to your point, I agree a hundred percent. Well, and you know, it's funny you say that because after the whole Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd and then Breonna Taylor, yeah. and then after... I think it was after June, I got a phone call from a a professionals in the industry as well. And I was asked the question, so what is it that you're currently doing for the community? And I, I stopped and paused and I said, excuse me? And she was like, yeah, so what 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 are you doing for the community now? I said, what do you mean? What am I doing for the community now? Just because you're now catching up to what we mm-hmm. have been doing does not mean that we haven't been doing anything for the community. The difference is, is now you care. Now you're paying attention. But all along, people have been doing it things for the community. It's just that certain people were never paying attention to what was going on in the community for you to give a damn. And now that all of it is coming out, now everybody wants to do the diversity and inclusion and blah, 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 which is great. It's wonderful. I am so happy that people are doing it. However, what I'm also concerned about is right now there's a push, there's a desire, there's a need. You know, it's kind of like the trending thing right now Yes, is the diversity and inclusion. And it's great and wonderful because it's trending. What happens when it stops trending? What happens when it stops becoming a concern? And it's becoming a concern because there's more people that are speaking about it and more people that are trying to bring it out to light. But it also takes, you know, uh, all of these people to start, like we're screaming at the rooftops, like this has been an issue. This is not something that just happened yesterday. This (laughs) just happened in the beginning of 2020. This not just happened when, when Trump came into office. This has been happening for a very long time. Black women have been dying on the table for maternity for a Mm. very long time. Mm -hmm. Black and brown communities and indigenous communities and people that are considered minority have been screaming all of these issues about these implicit biases, about doctors not caring, about people not paying attention to what they're saying because there's this stigma and it's also taught in medicine that... You know, pretty much black people's pain threshold is different than white people's pain threshold. Yes. And so we can deal with more. We can accept more. We can handle more. We can, you know, whatever. And then here's the other thing. And who created the standards of what the standard is? So because they created those standards, then everybody has to go by those standards. Why? Well, because they created them. It wasn't because, you know, it had to be that way, Mm -hmm. but it was because they created them. So automatically it's a standard. Mm -hmm. Says who? Mm. Says who? Mm. Why does it have to be a standard? Because you said so? Well, who? How about that? Mm -hmm. So, you know, Lord knows, we can go down this rabbit hole. (laughs) That's why I said, like, I don't want to draw this out. So I'm only going to say the two things, but this is, I could do this conversation all day just because it's so unbelievable. 
it's so unbelievable, really. And I really, you know, what I also don't want to do is make it that this is a people don't care or this is a only a black issue or only a white issue or whatever. The whole point is this is a collective issue across the board, across every person, every yeah. body, every every country, every single thing. There is these uh, these systemic issues that are going mm -hmm. on and it's time that we just stop talking about it and start doing something about it. It's not just, yeah. let's not just say, well, I mean, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about it and we'll eventually get there. No, we're here. We're 2021. We're here. <laughs> we are here. Um, one of the things that I have been in conversation with these women about is, to your point, is not just a black or brown women thing. When we look at infertility, that's for women. That's it doesn't matter what color you are. Your insurance company is not paying for what nope. you need either. Nope. Now, the reason that it, we I highlight black and brown women is because if you are able to pay for something, a white woman makes more money than a black woman because we're making 62 cents. It was 61 cents. We got a penny. We earned a penny last year, I guess. But we're at 62 cents on the dollar of a white man. So, yes, we have uh, we're under this umbrella of fertility issues. Right. And that's going to affect any woman who is trying to, like, reproduce. Um, but when you are a black woman, there's just another set of stairs that you have to take. And they are steeper because nine times out of 10, if you live in this country, you're making pennies on the dollar anyway. So that's why it's just, it's, it's everybody's concern. We should all be concerned about this. And in addition to that, you need to shine a light on a bigger problem under this same umbrella. So this is not like black and brown women off in a corner fighting this battle that is only our struggle. It's not only our struggle. And it, and for men who love women, who have a mother, who have sisters, who have coworkers, who are um, women, this is your issue too. Mm -hmm. Because you love us if you say you love us. And even if you don't love us, you got to live on this planet with us. And it, it affects us. And because it affects us, it's going to affect you. And so to me, it's, it's a broader issue. It's not just the black and brown women, right. you know, rattling pans like, hey, we're over here. No, it's a it's a much bigger issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it really needs to be where, again, going back to the community that provides the care, mm -hmm. a shift has to happen. <sighs> yeah. And a shift has to happen not until we are in our late 30s, early 40s, and now trying to deal with all of the issues with infertility or whatever. And this is regardless of the mm -hmm. color of your skin. Mm -hmm. Conversations need to begin happening in homes when these yeah. children are young, in schools, and not just about okay, we're, we're going to talk about the reproduction education or sex education where the only thing that's really teaching them is just don't get pregnant and uh -huh. <laughs> they STDs and, you know, that's what they're talking about. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, where doctor's offices need to start stepping up and start having conversations with women once they get into their 20s about their fertility planning. Okay, is it something that you mm -hmm. ever consider? No, it's not something you consider? Fine, but you need to know what you need to know ahead of time. Don't wait until you're 30, 40 years old and having problems and then figuring it out. The next thing is the government as a whole needs to start paying attention to what it is that we are, number one, putting out there. Number two, how are we even... So it, I'm, I am now getting clients to, that need surrogacy mm -hmm. in their late 20s, early 30s. Clients, intended wow. parents. And it, it is starting... That's very young. That's, that's yeah. young. And it's starting to really make me think about, okay, what are we doing as a society that there are so many young people that are having infertility issues earlier and earlier and earlier on in life. I don't know if you've ever watched, um, there's a movie, oh my God, what is that movie called? It was about DuPont. I don't remember, I don't know if you remember DuPont. It used to be a huge company and mm -hmm. to make like um, pans, Teflon pans. Yeah. Um, and it, it was a huge company. Well, they had 
a, a whole community where they the environmental pollution. Yes, and yeah. I mean people were dying, animals yeah. were dying, people had yeah. all kinds of cancers. They was affecting their fertility, it was affecting you know all of their lives or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this whole community was pretty much affected. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was in West Virginia, and it was Julia Roberts in that movie. Was it Julia? Roberts? There've been a couple of them. No, I no, this is a recent three one. Three or more, but no, this is a recent one. And infertility was a problem. Deformalities were a problem. Like mm. children were being born with being, you know, deformed and all kinds of stuff. And come to find out, it had to do with the the soil that they were putting chemicals and everything <sighs> else that was seeping into the soil. It was killing the animals. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, people were drinking this stuff and everything else. And it goes back to, let's really think about why is there all these infertility issues? It doesn't matter the community. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? And when are we going to start having the conversations of, okay, okay, what is causing this? What is mm -hmm. causing someone who is 30 years old to um, have six different miscarriages, unexplained, has no idea why, can't carry a pregnancy and needs to work with a surrogate? What is causing a 20-year-old to have to have a hysterectomy? Um, mm. you know, what is causing a reason why somebody just continues having all of these medical problems, these heavy periods, all of these fibroids, all of these, you know, and, and it's like the medical community keeps trying to fix the problem instead of somebody saying, okay, we need to stop. We have to fix the problem, but we need to stop and start researching as to what is causing all of these problems. What is causing mm -hmm. all of mm -hmm. not just women, the root of it. women, right. And get down to the foundation and fix it. Because if we don't eventually fix it, that Handmaid's Tale movie that everybody, you know, has talked about <laughs> yes. off and on can really become a, not that, you know, there's going to be a community where they're going to just yeah. have people just having babies. But I'm going back to a community where you can't even have children, period. Yeah. You know, nobody is having children because there's so many infertility issues. Even if you work with the surrogate, there's not enough surrogates out there right now for yeah. the amount of intended parents that want to have children. There's not enough. And it's it's mm -hmm. kind of a a scary thought to think about, like, where are we really going as a society? As humanity, where are we going as humanity? One thing that you said, what can the doctors do? I do believe that there are steps that doctors can can take. Like for starters, I don't know who makes their rules, <laughs> but why is it that when you go in and you're 16 or 18 and you have your first pap smear, why is there no baseline taken so that we know our AMH and FSH? Why, is, why does it happen? Insurance. Yeah. Insurance. Exactly. So I'm saying things that we could actually be doing to help. That's one of them. Um, why don't you tell me this every two years? Like the so I'm now old enough to have to get a mammogram every however many years. Well, 10 years ago, why wasn't I having this same situation with testing my my fertility level? Mm -hmm. Why I was 42, I think, 43 when I first took an AMA. Yeah, 43. AMH. Well, even if I had to pay out of pocket, it's a hundred dollar test. Mm -hmm. What if I had known at 25 that I should start tracking it? Mm -hmm. You're 25, get your baseline. Mm -hmm. You're 27, inch into 30, you need to get your baseline. Oh, you're 30 now. You don't know what it's going to look like at 30 because you might have just fell off a cliff in terms of your eggs. You don't know that. To have that conversation and finally get this test after I am researching a film where AMH pops up and I'm like, oh, I should probably know this number. Yeah. That shouldn't be the case. So that's something doctors can, it, I mean, as a system. It, like, it just inform us. Yes, and it needs it to be system-wide. This needs to be something. When they go to med school and you learn to put the little stethoscope on and listen, you also need to know, ask for this test. Like, help your help your female patients. Are you kidding me? So I just think, Across the board, it needs to be an overhaul. And I don't like want to place blame on doctors because no one doctor, I think, can 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 really make that huge a, a mark. It has to be a system change, like a change. The whole entire system um, needs an overhaul in that regard yeah. to just let us know the simple things. And Kelly Stewart, she's in the documentary. She's an actress. She says it beautifully. If this were happening to men, 
if men were waking up one day sure. with like a 60 to 80 percent drop in their fertility, that would be a test of whatever they need on every corner where they could go in a vending machine okay. and put in a dollar and get okay. the test. Oh, but it's not okay. happening to them. I mean, and if so, you look at how easily they can go and get Viagra or whatever, but as a woman, I, you know, I, I get a, a UTI or I get mm -hmm. a, a yeast infection and I can't, the medicine that you can buy at a store doesn't work. So I need to get a Diflucan, but I mm -hmm. can't because I have to wait for the nurse to call me back to, to wait. Yes. Say, well, you have to come in as a patient to be seen for us to make sure that, you know, I've had a number of yeast infections. I know with the difference already, I know how my body works. <laughs> yes. I promise you it's a yeast infection. It ain't nothing left. But yes. It's easier for a man to go and get Viagra pills than it is for me to be able to get that medicine. That is, yes. should easily be done over the counter when it's needed. But, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, we're women, we're stupid. We don't really, you know, we don't know our bodies. I actually had to have a come to Jesus moment when I was having my son because I'm telling the nurse, like, okay, this baby, I've, this is my fourth delivery. I'm telling the nurse, okay, this baby's coming. She's like, oh no, sweetie, I just checked you an hour ago. And you know, <sighs> and I turn around to her. I was like, look, I have had now the fourth child. <laughs> I promise you, I know what my body is telling me and my yes. body is telling me this baby is coming. She lifted up my leg and she was like, oh my God, his head's right there. I was like, yeah, no kidding. That is the point. No kidding. I know his head is right there. I'm trying to tell you. And I had to <laughs> you with my first son too when I was having him. And I had him, I was young. I was 19 when I had my first son. And they, I wanted to breastfeed and... I, I just wasn't producing enough. Well, instead of bringing the baby to me to latch on, they decided that they were just going to feed him formula mm. and then bring him to me after he's fed. What baby do you know? A newborn that after he's full and fed is going to latch on. And, it's and not. To eat. Mm -mm. So not. at 19, I knew then that I needed to learn to speak up for myself. Self-advocacy. Right. And that is the thing. And learning just... Just yesterday, I had a phone call. We, we screen our donors before we put them in our database. And we told this donor that unfortunately she doesn't meet the criteria she couldn't match or couldn't be in the, do the database. And it was her AMH level. Mm. And we, because we have everybody do an AMH through the program. Yeah. And her AMH level was below the threshold. And I, she called and said, I, I understand I'm not going to be a donor, but I have this AMH tested. Like, what is that? And I'm telling her what it is or whatever okay. and what the purpose of it is. And she was like, well, because I called my doctor's office and the nurse never even knew about it and had no idea. Is it something that I need to be concerned about? And I'm like, mind you, this woman is 22. And I said, yes, it is something mm -hmm. you need to be concerned about. You need to schedule an appointment with your gynecologist and you need to immediately a with her. And if she doesn't understand, then you need to go find another doctor is what I told. And immediately. I'm like, yes. And I'm like, and you need to go find another doctor because there is no reason why your doctor's office should not know what AMH is, especially with the nurse that's handling your care. And there is no reason why you shouldn't be going into your gynecologist at 22 years old and having conversations about your fertility plan. Which no one, I'm sure, has ever talked to her about. No. Because you're trying to be a donor, and if your AMH is low, you might need a donor. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, the conversation hadn't happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And why is that? So that's part of, like, I don't want to jump ahead. I want to finish this film and, you know, <laughs> move forward. But um, a shorter version of this, we have to do it for doctors. Uh, would, and early on, that was part of the plan. Like, we would just pull out a piece of it. But I realized there were chunks of, when, whenever someone says, well, how do we move forward or what do we do, do going forward? What's happening with the um, maternal mortality rate? I didn't interview doulas. They need to be a part of the conversation. I didn't interview midwives. They need to be a part of the conversation. So that when we give this shortened version, this 30-minute clip um, to physicians around the world, they won't be able to say they didn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And going back to, to the eggs over easy. Um, so eggs over easy starts with the acknowledgement that women of a certain age are constantly asked about their family building intentions. And the film provides the advices of, if you don't know the answer, do not ask. Why mm -hmm. start the film with that advice? 
Well, as a woman who is from the South, first of all, the question is aggravating. Just for me, it's just an aggravating question. They have 20 years of when are you having a baby? Or, oh my God, are you pregnant when you aren't? You had three donuts for lunch. Or like there are other reasons why you are bloated today. Or maybe you are packed with 17 centimeter fibroids. There are other reasons. So for me, it was just aggravating. But when I started having these conversations with my friends, not for it's small and aggravating for me. Well, that translates to very painful for some other people. So if you're asking a woman, oh, when are you having a baby? Or you're asking a couple, oh, when are you going to do your next one? You may not know they just had nine miscarriages. I read Gabrielle Union's book after I saw a couple of her interviews. And when she kept saying how it triggered her every time somebody asked that question, my friends were saying that too. Once we started talking about it, you don't want to, your response to the question of when are you going to have kids it's probably I had five miscarriages and the last time they told me I need a surgery that means I can't have kids anymore. Who wants to have that conversation? And if you're not that person's partner or spouse, it's none of your business. Even if you birth this person, it is none of your business until they get ready to tell you. So if we as a society stop asking people this question because you don't know what you are triggering um, for. I have a loved one who last year had back to back miscarriages, two miscarriages in one year. It was a short time window, like eight, eight months, maybe. And she kind of was forced to mention it on social media because everybody kept coming and oh congratulations oh we heard this oh is that a baby bump so you have to have a conversation that maybe she wasn't even ready to have mm -hmm. second so definitely not the second time. Definitely not ready to have it after a second loss in that small amount of time. So if you have to ask the question, that means you're not part of this woman's close-knit group, which might just be her and her partner. And it's none of your business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Matter of fact, Michelle Williams. So on the Shade Room, uh, Michelle Williams had posted a uh, just a regular video, like a, a just a post, a regular post. And someone in the comments said something like, you must be so bored. You need to go have children. It had nothing to do with whatever she was. She might have been saying the sky was blue. It had nothing to do with it. This person had the audacity to sit on this girl's page and tag her to say, oh, you're just bored. You really need to go have children. Number one, it's none of your business. So when she responds back to the person and tags them to say, it's none of your business. Mind your own self. Like, this is not your, your business. The Shade Room picked up the story and covered it. And at the same time, I was printing up shirts. I just started to open a merch shop for the film, um, like as part of the rollout to the film. And I have a, a, a line that says, mind your own uterus. Because if you do that, if everybody minds their own, <laughs> this world would be a much better place. But for people to have the audacity to think that they can ask you, whether it's your sister or a perfect stranger, what your plans are for your uterus, that is just so beyond my comprehension because it's not their business. But, but that's because society feels that when it comes to women, that they can dictate what a woman can do with her body, how she can do whatever she yes. can with her body, where she can go, what she can do, who she should do it with, like, mm -hmm. and then want to mind their body and their uterus yeah. and, and yes. all of the things. So that's where yeah. the issue is right there. It's that's the where it is. I have a friend, she's a... um. She's a dentist. She and her husband have five daughters, five beautiful daughters. And one of the things that was so interesting and kind of funny, but definitely interesting, is it's like the flip side of the coin. They're telling her to stop. <laughs> when are you going to stop? Are you trying for a boy? Because it's all girls. Um, you Y'all should stop. She and her husband did not ask anybody to pay for a diaper for these kids. They have the liberty to do whatever the heck they want to do. But people still feel inclined to impose their beliefs onto somebody when it's not their business. So that in that situation, it's not someone who doesn't have kids. She's got five of them. And if she wants to have another one, guess what? It's still her business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. One of the things that I, so on, on the Eggs Over Easy, you have voices from nearly every aspect of fertility, family building, mm -hmm. maternal health. Why was it important to include such a wide representation? So when I started, um, started the process, 
I knew early on that we were talking about fertility and not infertility. Mm -hmm. Fertility runs the gamut all the way from women who physically they're fine. They do not want children. They are child free by choice all the way to women who are having issues and need um, support. They need help building their family or making their making their family. So for me, I wanted to I knew that we couldn't do a deep dive on anything. You can literally take every segment of this film and do a documentary on it. Somebody else can do it. (laughs) I can't do it. Somebody else can do that. Um, But it was important that if we're going to have the conversation, I want to put it all on the table. Mm -hmm. And whoever else, like one man plants, another waters, and God gives the increase. So I'm just planting the seed. Like, y'all, this is what we need to be talking about. And anybody who wants, you want to write a book, go ahead, knock yourself out. Um, Because we've not told the story, there are so many stories to tell. I had to stop filming, not because there weren't enough stories, but because I ran out of money. Like, you can't have a 10-hour long film on a $2 budget. So I I had to stop. Um, But hopefully there's enough in there that whether you are a woman who, like, one of the... Tracy, that's someone in the film. She's my line sister who knew forever she didn't want to have children. And no doctor would perform, um, they wouldn't tie her tubes because she was under 40 with no kids. And they told her that she would either need her husband's permission and or a psych evaluation. I believed her when she told me that, but I just thought it was a one-off. I didn't know that's like the rules. And so it's the rules. And that's part of fertility. Her fertility story or a woman who doesn't want have want to have kids, that fertility story is that I do not want to have children, which is, you know, polar opposite from somebody who's trying. But it doesn't minimize the story. It doesn't make it any less of a a need that somebody needs to be lobbying to say, if a man can go and have a vasectomy in 15 minutes, why does this woman need a psych evaluation? Why does she need her husband's permission? Because you are making assumptions. One, you're assuming she's married. Two, you're assuming she's married to a man. (laughs) Because that's not necessarily the case. And what happens to a woman's authority to make decisions about her body? Because we can't go in and have a 15-minute procedure like a man can if he does a vasectomy. That's absolutely a part of the fertility journey. And so that's why we included all of it. Mm -hmm. What did you learn that surprised you most along the way of making this film? (sighs) There were a lot of surprises. The cost, that was a surprise. The fact that there are loopholes around the cost, like I didn't know if you're in your 20s and you have, um, you know, viable, good eggs, you can do a program with many fertility clinics where if you go in three times, if you do three donations, the first two are they, they pay you for them. You're donating those eggs. And the last um, set of eggs, they will store them for you. You keep them. They're yours. So if you pop up in 10 years or you're not married or you have a medical condition or your um, ovarian reserve drops, like takes a dip, you will still have like this insurance policy on your own fertility. So you go in three times, the last one you get to keep them. So not only are you not having to pay this like twelve to 15000 for egg retrieval and freezing, you're getting paid for the first two that you that you donate and then they're holding the other ones. So in, in different fertility centers have different programs, but mostly all of them have some sort of program similar to that. I had no idea. I had no idea. And I think if someone is a college student and you don't know over the next 10 years, like you have no interest in marriage. You don't even want kids, but you just want the insurance policy that maybe one day when I'm 40, I might. This is an option for them that they may not know even exists. So I learned that and that was huge. The cost of it all, um, that was pretty big. And I think probably the other lesson I learned is that there are more stories than any of us are imagining, any of us is imagining. Because if I could pick up my phone and click any name (laughs) and nine times out of 10, they have dealt with something that I talk about in this film, then everybody can. Your circle the people that you're closest to, I look at it as being your garden to tend. Those are the people that you should be like having these conversations with. Everybody doesn't have, a, not like I'm not a celebrity. I can't, I don't have 2 million Instagram followers and you know, I give them this message and it goes around the world, but I have 2000 followers so I can tell them things and then they could tell somebody and they could tell somebody. So I think that part of the lesson is that you just do what you can and get in the messaging out to let people know like, OK, we're going to make this a safe space to have this conversation about what's happening with our bodies. And then they tell somebody, they tell their cousin, they tell their friend, they tell their sister and open up the conversation. And what what ends up happening is 
just organically, we're talking about it more. So after I did um, a screening and we had a Facebook uh, Q&A uh, where we were all just talking about topics from the film, one of those topics is miscarriage. And I was saying how women are expected to just go back to work. Like you get your two days off, which many times is your personal leave days. And then you go back to work. You don't talk about it. And you're supposed to still be working at like level 10 when you just had this massive loss in your life and you're not talking about it. And even their friends don't know. And one of my closest friends who was in a group chat with me like we chat all day I, my friendship groups we chat all day that's how I keep sanity right well one of them she says thank you for that two weeks ago or no it was months two months ago um I lost my daughter what are you talking about well she had miscarried and we talk every day like we are good friends this is not an associate in passing mm -hmm. this is like a, a friend mm -hmm. and the fact that this had happened and she never even she said she just didn't think about telling anybody uh, outside her husband. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think once we normalize it and let like we make safe spaces, um, that's how we move forward. That's how we take the conversation forward, because you could be on a group chat with one of your dearest friends who two months ago just had a miscarriage. That means we could have been bringing you food or dinner, lunch, breakfast. We could have been checking on you. We could have been sending flowers and love notes. Um, lots of things we could have been doing to support had we known. So for me, that was one huge takeaway. You just never know who in your mm -hmm. circle is dealing with mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. I know. What, what else would you like to see as a result of this film? The biggest thing, well, two things. One is everybody talking about it and normalizing the conversation. That's first. But the biggest thing is we need change in the medical community so that we can stop dying. So one of the segments of the film is the maternal mortality um, rate and the fact that we die like three to four times more than non-Black women when we have childbirth. That figure, I don't have I don't have good words for it because it's just an unbelievable number um, of us who just die. So at the time, I think we were finishing the edit, um, a story broke. There was a woman, black woman from the CDC, had like a PhD. This is somebody with good insurance. <laughs> okay. She was like at Emory Hospital being um for, for her her delivery. Yep. Goes home and she dies. Yep. And that started, although I had already included it in the film, um, Charles, I think his last name is Smith, but his wife's name, his wife's name is Kira, and she um she's he is Judge Hatchett, Glenda Hatchett's son. And so this is her daughter-in-law. And she died perfectly healthy, running marathons. She died after her second baby. So I was aware of it. I included that in the film. But I also I live in Atlanta. So when this woman who works at the CDC with a PhD, who goes to like the best hospital ever. Um, they sent her, she had a headache and they sent her home and she died. I don't have good words to put around that. I don't know, like how, how does that even happen? Mm -hmm. So if the medical community could pay attention Mm -hmm. If that's the takeaway, like if, if if they watch this film, if every doctor who watches this film or every nurse practitioner, every physician assistant, the healthcare people, if they watch the film and can tell one doctor one thing, like that would I think save lives. That would to me that would be the whole point of the film. So in speaking with doctors, and I asked, well, what literally, what can you be doing? Um, one of them, Karen, she's Dr. Karen, she's in the film. She said, well, if we send everybody home with the blood pressure cuff, they can keep a count on what their blood pressure is. The, the mothers can keep a count on their blood pressure, keep a record of it. And if something spikes, you have data to tell your doctor mm -hmm. so that you they don't think you have a headache. They know that you're maybe stroking out. Um, how difficult is that? It's a $20 device. Mm -hmm. Somebody can sponsor it. If the health insurance doesn't pay for it, where is Pfizer? <laughs> like, where are the, like, when you have a baby and they send you home with this bag of pampers and treats and like items that somebody is selling, um, they give it to you for free so you can keep buying this pamper, like a, a promotions bag. Can they not put a blood pressure cuff in there? Uh, when we talk about what your support system looks like, I did not know what a doula was. I didn't know the difference between a doula and a midwife. Mm. I had no idea. I didn't know that some hospitals don't allow you to have like a midwife's in. Or if, if you have a doula, your insurance may not cover the doula because they look at it as like a non-essential part of your healthcare plan. So they don't cover it. You have to cover it. Well, what if that was covered? So that you have somebody who stops by you, especially if you're high risk. And if you're Black, you are probably high risk. So 
you have somebody who every day for the first seven days stops by. Yeah, they check on the baby, but they check and just make sure that like you're not dying. Those are small things. And if that one one thing could be the takeaway for the film and save lives that are just being lost unnecessarily, that would be a win for me. For every doctor who looks and says, yo, Serena Williams could have died because she had a blood clot and told her nurse and her doctor, and both of them said, nah, you good. Well, because she had had one before she knew she wasn't good mm -hmm. and pressed the issue. Her husband had to come in and help press the issue. And so thankfully she's alive. But what if she hadn't said anything and she blew a clot? Mm -hmm. It would be a different story. So if one doctor can look at this and say, this rich, famous woman with a million, trillion, you know, Twitter followers um, could have died on my watch. Well, what's happening to Sally Jane or Shaquita, who isn't famous? Mm -hmm. I need to pay attention. Mm -hmm. That that would be, to me, that would make it all, all work. Well, I guess my next question is, so how can folks see the film? <laughs> so we will be on OWN, the Oprah Winfrey Network, in the fall. I am beyond excited about that um, because she's been on my vision board for probably 20, at least 20 years. Okay. So we'll be on OWN at the end of, towards the end of the year. Um, but for now... You can just follow us on Instagram. We are on Instagram and Facebook. It's Eggs Over Easy Film. So that's easy to find. Twitter kind of played with our name a little bit. So on Twitter, it's just at Eggs Film. I do not know how that happened. They cut out all the middle words. <laughs> so it's just Eggs Film on Twitter. Um, but Instagram is where I'm most active. Okay, perfect. Well, it is a big, huge undertaking to jumpstart these conversations in yeah. um, in the Black community, but just community as a whole. But if ever there was a film to do that, it is it is the eggs over easy. And, I, I, and I'm grateful to also have been a part of that film. I mean, yes. I it's been in the works for quite some time. And Forever. from when it was, from when it first started and we were talking about it, it, it uh, up until this point, again, I know it's so much, it's so very much needed. Like, gosh, yeah. so much needed. So thank I you. thank you so much for your time and uh, your amazing contribution to the community through this film. Thank you. Um, and I'm just grateful that, you know, we have these opportunities now that we can kind of share and speak about what is going on and, and start bringing things to be addressed and, and talked about, but, and then figured out, like, we need to get to a point where change has to start happening. Yes. Yeah. And thank you so much for having me, Eloise. You really were a highlight of the film because you are just so funny and so to the point. Um, so I enjoyed all of that. And of course, we didn't know anything about the difference between a surrogate and a gestational carrier. None of that. So you are schooling the people. I appreciate it. Well, good. Well, thank you. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> grateful for that. So remember, Eggs Over Easy has a Facebook page and Instagram channel. There's merchandise and updates on screenings and other projects related to the film on the website, Eggs Over Easy film.com. Um, please make certain to like and follow. And if you are a medical professional or an educator, please consider this film for continuing education or education curriculum. Like it is so important that we get the medical community to be on the same page as these patients and mm, yes. start helping to prevent things, not waiting until something happens and then try to figure it out. <laughs> yes, yes. So thank you so much, Shakrita. I appreciate all your time. Thank you. You have a good one. You too. Thanks. I hope you found this discussion helpful as you weigh your next steps. You can follow Fertility Cafe on its new Instagram and Facebook page under Family Inceptions. If you haven't yet, go to your listening platform of choice and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. We'd also love you to share Fertility Cafe with friends and family members who would benefit from the information shared. Join us next week for another conversation on modern family building. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until next time, remember, love has no limits. Neither should parenthood. Thank you for joining us in the Fertility Cafe. Whether you're an intended parent, a woman considering egg donation, thinking of becoming a surrogate yourself, or a friend or family member of someone dealing with infertility, we're here to help. Visit our website, thefertilitycafe.com, for resources on fertility, 
alternative family building, and making this journey your own.